Welcome to the CBS show. It's the CBS show. Helping you expand on what you know. Throw in a meme of the week and a review of the screen. And you have a shot that covers everything. Hey, hey, Team Stevia, and welcome to episode 99 of The Stevia Show, a talk show podcast that covers pop culture, world news, local artistry, and everything in between. As always, this is Steven, and we appreciate you all listening to episode 98, Obscurities with Anthony. And today we have a nice, uh, nice big episode because we have kind of a big thing coming up tomorrow, which is the election. Uh, so co-hosting today is fellow creative Lakin, and we're also joined by president of Young Democrats of America, Joshua Harris Till. Uh, so how are you all doing today? Uh, great. It's good to be here. Always uh, happy to be uh, supporting you in anything that you do. And this is just one of those awesome things that you're doing that I appreciate. So glad to be here. Man, you're gonna make me cry on the podcast. Come on, man. That's I was gonna <laughs> say that was so <laughs> wholesome. Ow! <laughs> yeah, ow. <laughs> exactly. And how you doing, Lakin? Uh, I'm good. Uh, you know, Right in my thesis, normal grad student things. Oh yeah, um, I have homework due at midnight, so um, I'm gonna go. Yeah, ahead. I think I beat you to the uh, the posting today. Oh, you did? Okay, cool. Okay, so I think we're one one now on that. So that's good. Yeah. Um, perfect. So um, Lakin is like I mentioned, she's a fellow creative. Uh, she she uh, hosts a podcast called, uh, or sorry, they host a podcast called uh, Bootleg Muses, which you should definitely check out. It is a awesome time. And Josh is of course president of the Young Democrats of America, who's doing fantastic work across the country and we're looking forward to it but really quick the meme of the week uh, we do have mike cambiano with his second win with the meme about oklahoma's bad covid response uh so that's kind of like his that's kind of been his uh that's kind of been his uh, theme the past few days so we can go ahead and get into the topic that i'm sure everybody is starting to uh get tired of hearing about unless you're political nerds like us so we're going to talk about the election so lakin let's go ahead and get started uh, Josh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we know you're busy and appreciate your time. Um, to get us started, what have you seen on the ground that has made 2020 um, a different election from the 2016 election? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think uh, for me, what I've witnessed, and and a lot of my travels are obviously restricted now with COVID, uh, but before when I was able to be on the ground and since then, where I'm able to be in more places virtually, I've seen uh, an amazing level of outreach and mobilization. I think that we made some mistakes in 2016. We thought we had it in the bag. We're trying not to do that this time. And so we're making sure that we do outreach to the young people. We're doing outreach to the minority communities. We're doing outreach to faith communities. We're making sure we don't leave rural voters behind. Uh, we're making sure that everybody uh, or as least as many people as possible are being touched by the campaign. And so that's going to be a difference maker, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to kind of get more into it about, especially with your position in the Young Democrats, how um, how we're kind of changing that up. Because, I mean, I, I feel like in 2016, that was one of the biggest problems was not being able to connect with like millennials and Gen Z. Uh, but at least this go around, like you mentioned, like that's something that we're already changing. So we're looking forward to to hear about that. Um, so we're not going to really focus on Trump too much, uh, but I do want to know, um, can you explain why Trump is so well backed by the, um, by the evangelical community, especially whenever Biden's been a devout Catholic his whole life. I've always found that kind of baffling, like why, like that's always in the bag for Republicans. Yeah, well, it's messaging. And so the Republicans have framed themselves as the Christian party. Now, whether or not they back that up with their <laughs> actions is always something uh, to leave up to debate. But uh, the Democratic Party doesn't uh, frame themselves as a religious party. We frame ourselves as a party that's about making sure that we represent people. And we try to be very big tent. We try to be very inclusive. And we understand that not everybody in this country follows a religion. But because we have the separation of church and state, uh, the party isn't supposed to be about uh, religion, just like politics isn't supposed to be about religion. Yeah, we want you to uh, subscribe to whichever faith uh, you feel like represents you the best. But at the end of the day, politics is not about religion. Politics is about the people and making sure all of them feel welcomed, uh, involved, included, and represented. Awesome. Thank you, Josh. No problem. 
Yeah. Um, so Josh, I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on how important it is that Biden has learned from Hillary's mistake of um, taking the Rust Belt for granted. You know, um, I think that's a great question. And I think that when you break it down, it's not even specifically that she just took the Rust Belt for granted. She took um, the election for granted. Mm -hmm. uh, in football, they used to always tell me, uh, make sure you catch the ball before you turn and run. <laughs> and I think in 2016, <laughs> Uh, we were more worried about running than we were about catching the ball. And so a lot of voters didn't feel like they were being spoken to. They didn't feel like they were being uh, reached out to uh, by the Hillary campaign. And she was very openly focused on making sure we were picking up seats in other places, making sure that we had Congress, making sure that we were winning down ballot. Um, Joe Biden isn't doing that. And because he hasn't been doing that, I think that's why you see so many different states in play. I think that's why you can actually see him focusing on states that uh, haven't always been uh, Democratic strongholds or, or have in the past been Republican strongholds. Uh, he is focusing on making sure that he wins the White House. And because he's done a, such a great job of that, he's actually been able to spread some of that love to different races. But he started with making sure his campaign was on the right track. I don't think we did that in 2016. We didn't take Trump seriously. Uh, that's not a mistake that we're seeing uh, happen again in 2020. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think a lot of it, I mean, we, we hear all about like, you know, the fake news and all of that. But I feel like a lot of like what you said is so accurate where where you 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 turned around before you caught the ball to, you know, go score the touchdown because the media was totally like, you know, saying, oh, Trump doesn't have a snowball's chance in hell. And I think a lot of voters at that point, too. So not just Hillary, but voters, too, took that for granted that, oh, it's just Donald Trump. He's that guy from The Apprentice there's no way and there's no way he could win and then sure enough you know un un unfortunately he won um so that's so that's really interesting um so this is kind of a question for everybody and that is who do you think will win the election how certain are you in which states do you think are going to be the ones that are going to really be the, the focal points for the election oh they can you can start if you want yeah oh okay <laughs> um <laughs> So my, my, my background um, isn't necessarily in, in politics, um, although I wouldn't say that I'm not a political person. I think anybody that has ever <laughs> met me um, would definitely not say that. I, with the 2016 election, not to like back it up at all, but um, I think what Stephen has said is true. Um, and I think the, the comment about millennial and Gen Z connection is really interesting because for me, it seemed very much like no one took it serious. No, no one took Donald Trump serious. Um, and, and for me being a native American and, and being political since I was, I don't know, like 14, um, knowing his history with my community, I took it serious from the get go. Um, and I, I don't think that we are real willing to risk that this year at least I'm hoping not, but I, I've also learned from the 2016 <laughs> election not to, um, you know, leave anything for chance. So really um, doing like the grass work movement of making sure everybody that I know of is, is registered to vote and, um, you know, knows, knows the policies because a lot of times the policies that we vote on aren't um, worded clearly and that is with purpose. Um, what what my hope is is that Biden wins because I would I would take anybody that is not Trump um, and I hope that doesn't come across uh, too political on the Steve Hughes show. <laughs> um, my, my hope is that it'll happen. Um, hoping for the best, expecting the worst, and preparing for the worst as a as a queer native um, creative in America. So. Yeah, no, I feel I, oh, like, sorry, oh, this, the ahead. states that we need to look at, um, I saw that Texas is now considered a flip state, which I think is going to be huge, um, huge, yeah. <laughs> uh, Florida, um, is, is always like a wild card to me. Um, I don't know. I think there's a lot of really big movements happening in Oklahoma by young people. And I'm hoping that that reflects in our voting, um, 
but you know, it's, it's politicians, man, the electoral college. I, I, I don't know. It, it's hard not to feel kind of hopeless in these times, but yeah, um, I'm hoping everyone takes their anger out at the voting polls and lets our voice be heard if it I, can be heard i am gonna fill in that bubble so hard like <laughs> aggressively uh, yeah i'm yeah. just gonna be like, ah exactly so, <laughs> so josh do you want to go ahead or do you want me to make my prediction or um what do you uh, what what do you think yeah i mean if you want to go first please okay cool sure thing um so my map i am very cautiously optimistic for this and the reason why is that we've already been seeing higher voter turnout like like speaking of texas we're gonna be talking about texas a lot tonight i feel like um but the texas early voting actually surpassed the whole entire voting of 2016 which that is to me insane so i think a lot of people are angry just like what lakin was saying and and, and they had a very good point about that where we as millennials and we're going to talk more about this later but we're realizing like holy shit like you know this is actually starting to impact us like we're not kids anymore like we need to uh, be active in our communities so i am cautiously optimistic that biden's going to win um and i think the state that we need to look at the most on election night is going to is, is going to be florida because if biden does win florida trump really doesn't have a path to victory um so and and also florida was one of two states i got wrong in 2016 it was florida and iowa that i got incorrect so i'm still kind of bitter at florida but i hope i kind of get it right or i, I not kind of get it right i hope i get it right this time uh because you know for all of us here at the stevia show i mean we of course appreciate all political views but um myself and lydia we are both not fans of donald trump and if you uh, have been listening to us for any time during the past you know two years um you probably could have gathered that uh so i'd say i'm i'll say i'm 85 percent sure biden's gonna win um but again very cautious very very cautious about that 85 percent because we know what happened last time whenever it was supposed to be a, a whole like knock out of the park situation but i think the biden campaign's done a lot different this year yeah, no, it's um, thanks you both for sharing. I think it's always really interesting to get other people's take on it. Uh, I guess uh, counter to Lakin, I am a very political person. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really get the uh, benefit of saying that I'm not uh, with my position, of course. Um, <clears throat> here's the thing. I am confident that Joe Biden is going to win. Now, I say that and, and I knock on wood right. uh, while I say that, but there's three big things that you look at uh, that's a difference between 2016 and 2020. Uh, one, Hillary Clinton was a woman, and this is a very misogynistic country. We're still, uh, we still have a lot of progress to make in order for us to get past that. Uh, two, they vilified Hillary Clinton uh, unlike any person running for president had been vilified before. And even with the vitriol hatred they were able to create around her, she still won the popular vote. And then three, Donald Trump was, uh, you know, an outlier. He was an outsider. We, he didn't have a political uh, background to run on. And people were able to give him the benefit of the doubt and say, hey, maybe this guy won't be that bad. Um, the difference now is Joe Biden is a man. Uh, so that's going to be a boost for him already. Try as they might to make him hated, call him creepy, sleepy, saying he has dementia, all of them, you, you name it, they've said it about him. Uh, you still haven't been able to make him hated. You know, people still don't hate Joe Biden. They might not love him. They might not like him, but they don't hate him. And then on top of that, Donald Trump has a record now, and it is a record of repeated failure. And so... We uh, are optimistic about what we might get with Joe Biden because we saw him with uh, President Barack Obama. We are not optimistic of what four more years of Donald Trump looks like, no matter who you are, whether you believe you know he's done a great job with the economy or immigration. You can't take away from the fact that the economy's uh, in shambles right now. Uh, there's a crisis at the border where we've lost over 500, uh, where we separated over 500 families. And these kids, we don't know who their parents are. Like, uh, there's no wall there. All of the things, uh, the Affordable Care Act is still in place. All the things that he said he was going to do. Uh, and it's, it's hilarious to me that they make this promises made, promises kept kind of oh, yeah. for him. When in reality, he has been holistically ineffective uh, as a leader 
And because of that, I think you are seeing different states, Texas being uh, one of the biggest ones. He has a one point lead there. That's not something that you would expect anyone to be saying about Texas. And those early vote numbers are huge. Uh, but uh, Georgia, Georgia being a state that's in play that we haven't seen in play before, North Carolina, the amount of time and attention that they're given to that state, uh, Pennsylvania is definitely one that we're gonna have to watch. We've seen a lot of democratic success in that state, uh, hoping to see even more um, these states, you know, were states that uh, Michigan, these states are states that Donald Trump uh, won and he barely won them. Let's remember that Hillary right. Clinton won the popular vote and about 77,000 votes kept her from the White House. I think you're going to see huge voters turn out. I think you're going to see huge support for Biden. And I think that they are looking at the numbers saying Democrats have voted, uh, this many Democrats have voted and this many Republicans are voted, assuming that those Republicans are going to stay loyal to the party. But I don't feel like that's going to be the case this time around. The Lincoln Project, obviously. Oh, the Lincoln Project, that's that's been awesome. I mean, honestly, it yeah. really has been. Yeah, the greatest example of Republican loyalists saying that uh, we, we, we draw the line with Donald Trump. Uh, tons of endorsements coming from Republicans for Joe Biden. And the people are, are listening to that. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see. Yeah. Um, and Lakin, if you don't mind, um, um, before we go into uh, question five, um, I would like to say uh, that I am because, um, Josh, you mentioned a very good point with Hillary Clinton being a woman. She inherently was viewed as lesser of a leader, which is, of course, extremely unfortunate. And and this is something that we we hope to fix. Um, but we actually don't have any questions about Kamala Harris in here. But I just do want to give a quick shout out to Joe Biden to picking a younger um, you know, woman of color color uh, for being uh, his vice presidential running mate, because even though like it's you know plainly obvious, I am a white guy and one one day I will be an old white guy. Uh, I'm sick and tired of the old white guys. I mean, it's just one of those <laughs> things where we really uh, you know need to have not only diversity in our communities, but also in our government. And I think that that, that that's something that I, I really feel like Joe Biden has done well on, um, you know, with choosing Kamala, like somebody like he doesn't need obviously he didn't need California to win. He chose Kamala because because of, you know, her experience uh, as, you know, um, the attorney general of California, as a senator, as a senator of California, and the fact that he just believes that women should have a high place in, in government. And it's just, you know, cherry on top that she is a woman of color. I think that's, um, you know, um, obviously a big merit to Joe Biden. For sure. Um, and I would say, you know, I was on a call with uh, Germany. Uh, they had a group that was interested in, in our election. And I was talking to them and they were like, you know, who did you vote for? And I told them Elizabeth Warren is, was my pick. And that's who I believe right. was, right, should have been the president. But they were like, do you wish that Joe Biden would have pushed a, a pick Senator Warren? And I was like, no, Kamala Harris was the perfect addition to his uh, campaign for president because she brought a different level of, of, of uh, support, of outreach, of uh, tenaciousness uh, to the campaign. Uh, she's she's a, a workhorse for one, but she's also a dog in a fight. And you saw that when she debated Joe Biden, you saw that during uh, the Senate confirmation, like she is ready on day one to make sure that the negotiations are happening the way that they're supposed to and that the American people know that they have a fighter up there you might not feel as confident in the strength of Joe Biden, but you know, with Senator Harris behind him, they're going to get things done. And so I'm excited about that. Yeah, me too. She also referred to me as her cousin when I met because we got the same <laughs> last name. And I tell everybody we're cousins. And so uh, okay. it's beautiful. There you go. So so, so you, heard, you heard it here first. Josh's cousin, uh, Senator Kamala Harris, soon to be Vice President Kamala Harris. Uh, we're going we're, we're gonna, to we're gonna know somebody who is relatives with the second in command for the United <laughs> States. So that's amazing. We'll work on getting her on the show. Oh, oh my gosh. I, I'd flip. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, um, I did. I did want to mention uh, just because because Josh, I'd, I'd, I I want to make it clear. My comment was supposed to come off as a joke. I think it's because Mr. Till and I, uh, Mr. Harris Till and I don't know each other. Um, I am the most political person in my family. <laughs> and I've been called too aggressive. Uh, so you know, I also don't have the benefit of being apolitical um, as a as a 
femme presenting person who has a traditional native family. So I, you know, it, yeah. Um, what number are we on? Uh, we are on five. Okay. <laughs> You're good. Um, why do you think Trump has appeared so unhinged at the first debate and recent rallies? And do you think he knows the odds that are stacked against him? Oh, for sure. Um, he knows the odds. He knows that he's losing. Um, and he knows that maybe even if he didn't know it before, with uh, the devastation that COVID-19 has had on this country, uh, even if he didn't feel like he was vulnerable, he knows he's vulnerable now. Um, sorry about that. I got a phone call. Did I cut out? Oh, no, you're good. You're fine. Yeah, we heard you. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's always interesting when you uh, decline somebody's call, they call you right back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's actually my boss. Uh, so oh, he's no. Gonna, he's not going to be happy. Um, I was say, was but, that Kamala, I was say, if that was Kamala Harris, go ahead and, you know, like, push me, but, <laughs> go ahead and put this aside. That's <laughs> No, uh, Representative Flo, actually, out of Oklahoma City. Um, he's a good friend of mine, and I'm his campaign manager. Oh, cool. Uh, so... It was him, and he'll be like, "Why are you ignore my call?" But but he'll understand. Okay, um, <laughs> tell him we're sorry. But no, I think <laughs> I think um, I think that what you see with Donald Trump, uh, especially during his interviews, is he wants to control the narrative. That's why he goes on so many uh, shows and does so many interviews where people are friendly towards him. He gets to control the environment that he's in. When he doesn't control the environment that he's in, then, then you know, that really bothers him. He hates losing. Uh, he said that on more than one occasion. He's even uh, joked that if he loses this election, he'll have to leave the country. I think that the people are laughing at that, but I think he's serious. Uh, he doesn't uh, like to be in last place, which is very interesting for somebody who's failed as much as he's had <laughs> he has over his career, but... Uh, he's seen those numbers. He's he knows that he's behind. He knows that uh, Joe Biden is out fundraising him. He knows that the polling numbers are looking bad. He knows that higher voter turnout means that Republicans lose. Uh, so he's seen all of that, and that is bothering him on a level that he wouldn't expect. Even to the point that he's attacking Fox News for airing Obama uh, speech on there that was negative towards him. The places he thought were safe spaces for him are. And he is becoming very triggered to use a word they like to use. And yet we're the snowflakes. That, that's just yeah. how it, right. Uh, that's how it works. Um, but it's also weird that you mentioned that, Josh, because I think that turning point may have been uh, that Chris Wallace interview where Chris Wallace just kind of like ripped into him because of his response of COVID. Um, and it, it was just weird seeing Fox News, who's no, normally like the, the home field for the Republican Party, kind of saying like, like there, like there's no way they could twist the facts into making it look good. Um, but speaking of the debates, um, I kind of got this vibe from uh, Vice President Biden. But do you, uh, Vice President Biden, excuse me. Um, but do you think that Vice President Biden was trying to comfort the American populace while also being aggressive against Trump? Like it was just so refreshing hearing somebody talk like presidential because we haven't had that the past four years, you know. Yeah, and that's exactly what he was doing. He, and he took those moments and he looked directly at the camera and said, I want to speak to the American people. He was doing that very intentionally. He knows that uh, what people want more than anything is a sense of normalcy. And the unfortunate reality, whether you love Trump or you hate him, is that he is never going to be that comforting voice in any time. Uh, not with COVID, not with our relations with uh, other countries, not with anything. He's never going to be the one who you can look to and be like, man, he just made me feel better about this. Uh, and Joe Biden is providing that. He's saying, hey, I want us to get not just back to normal, but be better than we were before. Yeah. And that takes all of us. And I think one of the strongest things he said was, uh, I'm not going to be about blue states or red states. I'm about the United States. And that is what people were looking for. I think Donald Trump lost those debates, not because, you know, Joe Biden just had the best points or the best facts or the best arguments. He lost it because people wanted him to look presidential for a change. And he, and he failed horribly at that. Gotcha. Well, thank you, Josh. 
Josh, um, do you think we can expect the working class to go back to Biden? By and large, does the working class seem to believe that Trump has kept his promises to them as the working class people? You know, I think that, um, again, COVID-19 forced a lot of education on people. Mm -hmm. And so if you were able to lie to yourself and be like, Trump wasn't that bad beforehand, now that COVID has shown uh, how, how, how major of a failure this is, uh, I don't think that that's the case. And uh, one of the things that he d did wrong more so than anything in this election season was he did not send out that second stimulus package. Uh, if he would have gave people a second check, I think his chances of women and winning would have went up. I think he would have honestly did better, even though it's not necessarily something that he's done. Uh, people would have appreciated having uh, those funds and having that kind of uh, protection in place. Uh, for the working class, um, they don't have their jobs right now. Uh, they're without food, they're without, um, they're, they're wondering if they're going to make rent. A lot of them are being evicted. Uh, their family members are dying or going to the hospital and leaving with these ginormous bills that they said wouldn't be the case. And, and now with the Affordable Care Act uh, looming on, on the possibility of being removed, a lot of these folks know that they're going to have pre-existing conditions because of COVID-19 and they might not be insurable in the future. I think uh, even with children going back to schools and getting sick, this is something that he can't deny. He can't talk around. He can't try to justify. He failed so horribly during this pandemic that even the folks who supported him beforehand and were making lots of excuses for him are not able to make those excuses now. And I think that that hit the middle class harder than it hit anybody. And so I think Joe Biden's doing a, a decent job. He could definitely be doing a better job. Telling people not to vote for him is something that I relate to personally, <laughs> but I wouldn't necessarily advise a candidate to do. Um, but I think that they, they, need, they need stability. What this country needs more than anything right now is stability. And Joe Biden offers that and Donald Trump doesn't, uh, even on his best day. Gotcha. Yeah, thank you, Josh. And I think that's a lot of really uh, that's a lot of really good points that you've made, because, I mean, we're seeing I mean, even like if if you want to buy into that, Trump is the you know economic uh, president because we had a strong economy. But the fact that he didn't even seem interested in giving us a second round of stimulus checks that we could have pumped back into the economy. It's like 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 hello like like that, that like that was a softball like that should have been like an, a really easy one and it wasn't um so we kind of not only that but his administration is saying they're withholding the second stimulus check until after oh the election. yeah we're being held for ransom yeah you're Lakin, you're absolutely mm -hmm. right i uh, you know slipped and forgot about that which if there's anything the working class hates more it's being held at gunpoint for money that we should be given anyway yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Lake, and thanks for that. Um, so we kind of talked earlier about um, millennials and Gen Z. So for millennials in particular, because all three of us uh, are um, millennials, and um, basically, does this have the potential to be the most important election of our lives? And will we finally turn out to vote? Um, one, I would say... Every year we say this is the most important election <laughs> of our lives, and every single year it's true, uh, because when we don't show up, then people who don't care about us get elected. Uh, two, I ran on this idea that we saw a record-breaking turnout in 2018, and the only way we're going to win in 2020 is if we break those records again, and we have done that. Uh, youth turnout is skyrocketing in so many different places. And uh, we have been very, very uh, intentional on making sure that the youth vote turns out. Uh, we actually just did a texting program with Women's March where we reached out to over 2 million young voters just to make sure they had a plan to vote. Um, and so I can't, I can't take credit, of course, for, for all of the amazing turnout that we're seeing, but People just like us have been very uh, intentional on making sure young people turn out to vote. And so we're seeing that and we know uh, two, two out of three young people voting are going to be Democrats. And so 
that those numbers are very, very uh, appealing uh, at the base level, and that's not including the folks who are, uh, feel a little disillusioned with the Republican Party. Um, this is extremely important, uh, an election for us, because if we care about climate change, if you care about gun violence, if you care about health care, if you care about anything, uh, that's on the ballot this year, especially with the Supreme Court. I think that Again, another mistake they made was pushing through that confirmation. Them waiting uh, would have taken the expanding the court's argument off the table, uh, so to speak. And that would have been something that, you know, they could have had in their pocket, just like the stimulus check. Um, they made a lot of mistakes that they didn't have to make. And I think that young people especially have been paying very close attention to what's going on and, and, and they're voting. And, and I think you see that. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if this is supposed to be a question for everyone or if it's just supposed to be for Josh. <laughs> but, it's a question uh, for everyone. Get in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I spend a lot of time with my elders because that that is an important part of uh, not just, I would say, my culture, but just existence in general. You know, these people have lived many lifetimes and it, it's always so curious to me when I ask my grandma, you know, has it ever been like this? And every single time I bring it up, she says, no, absolutely never. Even my great grandma before she passed um, said it was, it was never like this. And, you know, and she, she lifted the first depression. <laughs> so I, I, it just blows my mind. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm a millennial, but I, I believe I technically qualify as a cusp um, between millennial and Gen Z. And um, Josh brings up a great point about the young people are getting educated. And I think a big part of that education has been how globally connected we are on the internet. Um, and young people know how to navigate that a lot more clearly than um, either, even some of the older millennials. So Education is out there. It's free. Most of us have that computer in our pocket. So not, not to quote Dr. Campiano too, too harshly, but um, you know, there's a computer in your pocket at all times and the world is your oyster. So getting educated is such a huge, huge thing, huge, um, a part of this election. And um, anybody that is still on the fence, I'm not going to trash you, but please, 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 please get educated. The resources are out there. They're all over the internet. Do your part. Do your part because you think it's not going to make a difference, but it absolutely will. And this election, just like Josh said, every single election you have is important because you can't rely on the older generation anymore when times are changing and they're not changing with them. It is up to you to do your part, to see a world that you want to be proud of. And that starts with you. Lincoln, that was really yeah. powerful. Um, oh, go, go ahead, Josh. I'm sorry. Yeah, and I, and I just want to add to that because I think that is such a, a fundamentally great point uh, that they just made. Um, I voted in 2008, of course, for Barack mm -hmm. Obama. Uh, it was the exciting, hip thing to do at the time. But I didn't get involved heavily in politics until probably 2012, 2013. And... You know, I have uh, obviously devoted myself to it and, and I've been successful. I've made it to be, you know, the leader of the largest partisan youth organization in the country, right? But as I was doing my travels, I was in Kansas uh, speaking with the lieutenant governor and the governor at a round table with young people. There was a 16 year old in that room asking policy questions, mm -hmm. not just what do you think about young people? But that's like, well, you know, we've seen uh, these issues occurring and we know that the legislature, and it was just like so detailed uh, because she cared. I have a friend um, on Facebook or no, on Instagram. Her name's Addison. She is seven years old. This girl is knocking doors, doing phone banks, writing postcards. It blows my mind how much young people are devoted to saving this world. And I say all the time, millennials are getting the job done in terms of, uh, you know, politics. 
but Gen Z is going to create every single ounce of the change we want to mm -hmm. see in this world because they are committed to it at such an early age. I don't know. I'm here and I started, you know, as late as I did. Where would I be if I started even earlier? And I'm, I'm so excited to see, you know, young people getting involved and, and educating themselves and being active and activists. That's, that's phenomenal to me. And I don't think that we, we talk about it nearly enough. Yeah. And I think a lot of that isn't just out of, you know, them becoming interested at an early age. I think it's out of necessity. We really kind of handed them, you know, this, this planet that's already in the process of dying. And if they want any chance of making it out alive, they have to get involved. It's just like, you know, telling, telling a victim of abuse, I'm so proud that you made it out of there. I'm so proud that you survived, but what other choice did they have? Um, and I, th I think young people, Gen Z and the generation to come are, are really kind of not just stepping up to the plate, but ripping it out of the field and throwing it at their oppressors. And that is so rad to see. <laughs> The, yeah, it's really, it's really, the, it. it's really the most punk rock thing they can do, and I, and I, I, I love it. Um, yeah, we it, love punk rock. <laughs> we, we do love punk rock. Um, but really quick before we, uh, Lake, before your next question, um, um, I do want to say that it is incredible seeing the, the youth, like, like you mentioned, turn out because even people like Greta Thunberg, like she, you know, is obviously she's she's part of the of the Zoomer generation, and then she is being mocked like nonstop by you know older Gen X by baby boomers by basically anybody on the planet older than, you know, maybe 40 years old, just throwing out a ballpark out there. Um, but they still have the courage to face that. And then especially we have um, activists uh, um, of the um, we have activists of color who are even facing even, you know, still like racially charged comments in our country, like whenever we have the Black Lives Matter movement and we see people who are young and they're being ridiculed for that. And it's just like the fact that they are standing up to that adversity and they don't even have their their quote unquote voice to change it in the ballot box yet is just so inspirational. Um, and Lakin, that's another good point that you made about, about survival. Um, if we were talking about our, our thesis earlier, um, I did my um, capstone on how previous generations have effectively killed the millennial, the, the, the American dream for millennials. And it's just like, we, we've been handed all of this bad stuff, but I would like to argue that millennials like in past times, like we, we failed to show up and it's just, it, it's, 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 it's inspirational seeing Gen Z picking up where we left off and I'm very, very supportive of it. It's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I, <clears throat> not to expose myself, but I, I frequent quite a bit. Um, and there's, there's a lot of jokes about millennials on there. Not that any of them are undeserved. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it's great seeing the younger generation really kind of step up to the step up to the plate. Um, Moving on. <laughs> yeah. uh, was that was a good the... rabbit hole, though. That was great. I that was a good, wholesome conversation. Loved it. <laughs> uh, to an extent, do you think that the Trump quote unquote shakeup was necessary to expose some of the darker sex of our culture? Um, no. I think that it was very clear that a lot of these issues were existing. Uh, the folks who needed this to happen in order, in order for them to pay attention um, just didn't want to know, right? They didn't want to educate themselves. It's the same, like when we, like you said about Black Lives Matter, like people know what Black Lives Matter means, mm -hmm. but they still say all lives matter. They still say blue lives matter. They still say we need to stop black on black violence. It's not because they don't have the education. It's because, you know, inherently they're racist or they're right. prejudiced or there's some form of hate in their heart <laughs> that they have for people and they want to blame it on everybody but themselves. Uh, I do not subscribe to us needing Trump in order uh, in the, Trump to get elected in order for us to get our act together. We just need to get our act together. You can touch the stove and see that it's hot or you can hear somebody tell you that it's hot and believe them, right? And we weren't doing that, um, not because we didn't have the ability to, but just because we didn't want to at the time. And now he forced us to, and I don't think that we needed to be forced to. I think we could have had Hillary Clinton we could have had a phenomenal society growing 
and thriving and not making the mistakes that we've been making over the last four years and everything would have been a lot better and we still would have had a Bernie Sanders type message and Elizabeth Warren type message and Andrew Yang type message, and Tom Steyer type message uh, pushing for Democrats to be better. We are not a perfect party. We're not as progressive as we need to be. We have a lot of work to do, but I would rather us do that work with a competent leader in place than for us to have to like take so many steps back in order to understand the mistakes that we made. We can do that, we just have to want to. And I think our generation does more so than other folks, but uh, we didn't show up to vote and that was our fault. We, we failed in 2016 to make our voices heard and we made up for it in 2018. We're making up for it in 2020, but we didn't have to fail in 2016 for us to understand what we understand now. We just did. That was very powerful. That was very powerful, Josh. Um, and also a perfect segue into uh, the next question that we have. So um, I personally I identify as my, myself as part of the progressive part of the uh, Democratic Party. I'm actually wearing my Bernie Sanders socks right now because I knew we were going to be talking about the election. Um, but I do feel like Biden has done much better um, than in the past uh, of reaching out and adapting some of the policies to work with that group. I mean, I really believe that this has been the most progressive Democratic platform since perhaps Franklin D. Roosevelt. Um, so do you think that Biden is politically savvy enough to know that that is where the party is headed and that's where it needs to go? Um, I think it's not even necessarily about him being politically savvy enough. I think that Joe Biden understands that his opinion doesn't have to be the only opinion, right? Mm. And that if the country is in support of something that he also needs to be in support of that thing. Uh, he might not feel as strongly about fracking as we feel like he should. But if Congress passes the Green New Deal and they put it on his desk, he is not going to veto it. And that's what I try to tell people who are like, well, we should have had Bernie Sanders fight and isn't going to do everything that we need him to do. We're, we're focused on the wrong thing. Congress needs to be more progressive. I don't care how progressive the president is. Uh, if it's a Democrat and a Congress, House and Senate come together and say, hey, this is what we want, then we have to have a Democratic president who's willing to say, though I may not be uh, in full support of this, this is what the people are in support of as shown by their representatives in Congress. And so I'm going to sign it into law. And that is what we need right now. And I think that is what we get with Joe Biden. Someone, and, and, and truly the way that all uh, elected officials need to be, someone who has opinions, but doesn't subscribe to their beliefs so much that they won't listen to other people. And I think that is what we've seen from Joe Biden. He's, he said, hey, I made mistakes here. Hey, I thought that was a good idea and it wasn't. Hey, uh, how can I fix this? And that's the kind of leadership that we need right now. I think that is why uh, he's, he's worked so well with Bernie and Warren and all of these others, because he's saying, hey, I may not have the best ideas at the end of the day. And if these aren't the most popular ideas, if this isn't what uh, truly represents the party, then I want to make sure what I'm doing does. And so he's doing a great job at that. What I'm hearing you say is that the word for this election is accountability. <laughs> Accountability yes. is the word for every election. <laughs> <laughs> every election, every elected official, accountability is key. Yeah. Right. Let me say very clearly if you feel like your job <laughs> is done on November 3rd, mm. then you do not understand politics at all. No. As soon yes. as November 3rd is over on November 4th, take a nap because you're probably exhausted. I know I will be. <laughs> right. But on November 5th, then I want you to be calling those folks. Hey, you just got elected. This is the policies where we expect you to, to uphold. This is why I support you. This is what I think about this. Hold them accountable every single day. When I worked uh, for Congressman Dan Boring in the second district uh, and the Affordable Care Act vote came up, we had so many Republicans reach out and say, hey, we don't want you to support that. Democrats didn't call the office because they felt because they had a Democrat in office, they didn't need to worry about anything. Mm -hmm. 
But when it came to listening to the district, it sounded like the district didn't want us to support the Affordable Care Act, when in reality, Democrats just didn't make the phone call. You need to call when things are good the same way you need to call when things are bad. You need to call when you're worried and you need to call when you're excited. These politicians can only represent you if they hear your voice. So please do not think your job is done on election day. Preach. Yes, and, and also if you have an elected official who will not stay in office to take your calls, if you have an elected official in office who uh, defers you to somebody else where that is not their job, take note of that make your opinion known about they need to be in office listening to you and then if you they're still not doing their job vote them out of office get involved with your local elections because it starts with you and it starts in your community for you to be represented G Lake and I wonder who you were talking about with people not being in office that's a very <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah um right. Yeah. I like, Listen, I know, I know their phone calls. I right. know their emails. <laughs> and they know me. I, I am bullying my officials. Awesome. Um, and I also do want to before uh, the next question, I, I do want to say to fellow folks uh, who have privilege um, in society, um, just by, you know, being born into just, just by being born, you know, being born white, being born male, being, uh, um, you know, um, not identifying um, in part of the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, just like what Josh said, just because uh, if, if Joe Biden wins and you happen to be in that camp, like that doesn't mean that everything is fixed because it's not um, much like whenever, you know, you see um, Black Lives Matter um, murals being painted in the streets like, oh, you know, that, that like that solves racial injustice. See you later. Like, no, it, it doesn't. So we especially uh, people with privilege, we especially need to fight um, for our neighbors and for our community members who don't have who unfortunately don't have that same privilege um, because it is unfortunately that's who like that's who people listen to is people who are part of the majority group. And um, we need to advocate for that change and to um, step up to the plate and help out our neighbors. We, we don't need performative activists. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I agree. And, uh, and let me also just add, you know, if you can't find somebody that you feel like is representing your community appropriately, that probably means you need to run for office. And quit mm -hmm. making excuses on why you can't run for office. Well, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not PC enough or I have a pass. Donald Trump got a <laughs> Nothing is off the yeah. table anymore. Anybody can run and you need to run and you need to represent your, your own area. If you can't find somebody who's doing it. When I ran for Congress, it was because I couldn't support somebody who was running against uh, Mark Wayne. And I was like, I'd be damned if I give him a free pass. And it was a horrible idea. I didn't have the experience for it or the connections, <laughs> but I'm so glad that I did it. And, it. and it really shaped who I am as a person. It shaped how I felt about my community. It helped me understand a lot of the issues that was going on. Run for office yourself uh, and make sure that you're educated when you do it. Follow, connect with, you know, your local party, connect with uh, different elected officials to be mentors, but run for office yourself because we need more young people at the table who are actually going to listen to their community, who are actually going to try to push progressive ideas. If you're not getting what you want, then that means that you probably need to run. And I say that to both to you, Lakin, and you, Stephen, both of you as well. You let me know when you're running for office. You, call <laughs> me, you ask me for money. Okay. okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, okay. for sure. Okay, so we can only call and ask you for money if we're running. We can't just do that regardless. Exactly. Okay, oh, dang okay. it. Okay, so that's the path to the money. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, I, I would also say, you know, if you're worried about your political experience, then start building it. Yeah. Don't don't wait for the perfect time. Do it now. It starts in the cause... school boards and city councils. Honestly. Yeah, sorry, like and didn't and if, interrupt. If, if you're younger than 18 start start a club at your school if you're over 18 walk into whatever office you support and ask them how you can help because i guarantee you they have a list of things that they need people to do and they don't have enough people to do it For sure. and if you're yeah, if absolutely. you're gen z and you got that tech savvy <laughs> you can make so much money <laughs> by being somebody's um internet pr relations person yeah moving on <laughs> yeah um no. so we've already I... oh go ahead josh 
Oh, and I'll just say, you know, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm biased because I'm the president of Young Dems, but join Young Dems, but we also have college Dems, we have high school Dems, we have the Sunrise Movement, we have March for Our Lives. It does not matter what uh, you care about or what you're passionate about, there is a group, and specifically a youth group, um, that is probably championing whatever issues you care about. Find it in your local community, find it nationally and start it in your local community, connect with folks and educate them. Uh, because if we don't create that space, then we'll never be able to recruit people into that space. And, you know, politics is about, you know, coalition building. So if you're not building a coalition, then you can't be surprised when you're not seeing the change that you want to see. Very good point. Tea. That is the tea. Um, yeah. <laughs> that, that is the tea. Um, so we've already kind of talked about ver voter turnout. And I think we all kind of were in agreement that it is, is expected to be higher this year. Um, how much higher do you think voter turnout is going to be this election? Um. I mean, like percentage wise, I guess, is that what you're? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. I, think, I, I should have wrote that I more clear, that I'm sorry. What is it, Um, in 2008, we had like the highest voter turnout and it was like 51%, I believe. Uh, I think that, you know, we might get close to 60% wow. of voter turnout this year, um, which is, huge and also still like ridiculous in fact that 40 percent of eligible voters won't show up to the polls mm -hmm. but i think that we can push towards 60 percent of the vote with the numbers that we're seeing right now and then a huge boost on election day i think 60 percent of eligible voters might actually turn out to vote which will be monumental and have huge 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 uh um, ripple effects across, you know, the political atmosphere. Awesome. Absolutely. And I mean, and it's still, it's like, it, like, it's weird that we're excited about 60%, but then you have other countries where it's like 80 to a hundred. So it's like, we're, we're not where we're getting, we're where we need to be, but, but damn it, we're getting there, you know? It is. Right. It is really strange to be excited for a failing percentage. Right, right. Like, hey, we, <laughs> hey, we got a D in voter turnout. That's passing, you know. <laughs> or we're like as like an that. educator, that makes me <laughs> so uncomfortable. Yeah, it's yeah, it's so weird. Um, so how? Well, it's cool. and, and understand that's optimistic, right? Right. Like we we might we might only end up at fifty five. I think fifty five is what we hit on the low scale, um, because I think that you know we're going to see some crazy turnout on election day. Um, I I was gonna vote early and I didn't get to vote early because I moved and so my absentee ballot was for my old address. Mm. And so I'm one, I'm an election day voter who wasn't normally an election day voter, right? And so I think that, you know, there's so many people I know personally who are working in politics who are absentee folks who haven't got to vote yet because they've been working so hard on turning out the vote. Uh, but I think 55% on the low scale and I think 60% on the high. And if we do that, it will be crazy uh, kind of the results that we see. Yeah. And I, I um, oh, go ahead, Lincoln. Uh, yeah, I was, I was also going to be an early voter. Um, unfortunately, with how long the wait was, I wasn't able to stay and cast my early vote. Um, so I'm going to have to do it tomorrow. What's today? It's the third. It'll be tomorrow when it comes out, though. You, you, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, I'll have to cast it tomorrow. And um, I'm honestly kind of nervous because of how long the early voting lines were. I'm nervous about how many people are going to be there. Um, and where I vote hasn't been taking um, COVID precautions seriously. Um, and so I'm worried I'm going to be the only person there with a face mask, which doesn't help me. It's, it's to help other people, um, you know, cause I care about the well being of other people. So, um, yeah, it's, I think it's a little disheartening, um, how much we take for granted in terms of being able to vote. Um, so if you, you know, if you have to wait those long lines and you, you can't, like I couldn't, um, don't, don't feel bad and not turn out to vote, still cast your vote. I don't know who your employer is. If you have an employer, 
etc. Election day, do your do your do your part. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and it's and it's literally as easy as filling out a circle or I guess bubbling in a circle. Um, and, and don't feel rushed in the voters booth. If you need to ask questions, you can ask questions. Absolutely. Right. That is that, that is okay, your time. Go to OK Voter Portal um, today mm -hmm. and get your sample ballot, <clears throat> because what you don't want to do is get in there and see, you know, a lot of these names for the first time. Hopefully you've already seen your sample ballot. You know who's going to be on it. Uh, but, you know, make sure you take the time to actually do a little bit of research before you get in there so that you can vote with confidence. You don't want to be looking at those names and not know the difference between the two people. Obviously, I'm going to tell you to vote for the Democrat because that's who I am. Right. But <laughs> I want you to also be familiar with that person, you know. You should have looked at their website, looked at their Facebook page, you know, have some idea of what they're running on. Um, so that you can be making, you know, informed decisions, especially with the state questions and judge retentions, uh, which I can also give you my opinion on, but I'm not trying to make your show too political. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're just going to shift everything to this is going to be exclusively a policy podcast from here on out. Like only, the, <laughs> only the most dedicated of the dedicated will listen. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so kind of like star episode. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So kind of, uh, segueing into, um, basically having a voting plan and stuff like that. Um, how significant is it that places like Texas, especially Texas, Texas, but also like Georgia and North Carolina and even Arizona, like like Arizona is pretty much safe blue now. Um, like how like how significant is it that 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 these states are in play? Because if you would have told me if, like, you know, 2008, Stephen, like, hey, Texas might go blue in 2020, I'd be like, you're out of your damn mind. You know, like that's not going to happen. So so how like how, how monumental is that for this year? You know, we've actually been looking at Texas going blue, but we didn't think it would be until around 2024, um, 2028, just because of those uh, metropolitan areas are really booming, right? When you think of Houston, you think of Austin, you think of Dallas, uh, those populations are growing tre tremendously and they're very progressive areas. Um, but I think that, you know, what we're seeing is the failures of Donald Trump becoming the failures of the Republican Party. The Republican Party should have taken up for themselves and said, we are not going to allow Donald Trump to represent us because he does not represent us. And they didn't. They instead said, hey, we're going to go all in with Trump because we care more about winning than we do about, you know, the principles uh, that we hold near and dear to our hearts. And so what you're seeing is a lot of folks who are just disgusted with what the Republican Party has become. I mean, they're, the, the evangelical crowd isn't as uh, high of a percentage of support as it was before, right? Because they know that he's not uh, the perfect Christian that they thought he was. Um, the, the rural communities, you know, I'm going to bring back coal and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do this for you all. And then even Oklahoma, right? He came to Oklahoma in 2016 and he did not come back until 2020, even though this was the first state called for him in 2016. He kind of abandoned his supporters. He spent a lot of time golfing. He did not spend a lot of time campaigning. And these rallies are cool, but I tell people the same thing I told them with the Bernie rallies. You can put 50,000 people in a stadium in, you know, Texas, but 50,000 is not a lot when you think of the grand total of votes. Mm. Um, and you need every single person to show up. Uh, Bernie will tell you that right. specifically. Yeah. It's not just about having a huge rally. I also need to have huge voter right. turnout. And, mm -hmm. and as a Bernie, like, and, and as a, you know, Bernie simp, if you will, I mean, like Bernie supporters are very much, if, if we want to talk about taking it for granted, you know, like that's the, like your case in point, you're absolutely right. It's like, it's, it's one thing to go to a Bernie rally because like, yeah, he has like vampire weekend and like, you know, bands playing at his rally and that's a blast, but it's a whole other thing to go and vote for him. You know, I mean, and you're absolutely right. Yeah, I have friends who are Bernie supporters call me the day before election day in the primary in 2016 and say, hey, I'm not registered to vote. Oh, can no. I, can I <laughs> oh, my vote? God. 
<laughs> and these are the people who were going super hard on Facebook, right? Bernie is the best choice. Bernie's our man. We have to vote for Bernie. Everybody yeah. else is a non-starter, not even registered to vote. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, the unfortunate reality is that, you know, with Trump, um, again, in 2016, you had moderate Republicans who were saying, well, we'll give this guy a chance. He's a successful businessman. How bad can he be? Um, and here we are. The, the diehard Trump supporters are still diehard Trump supporters. But I think those moderate Republicans, those reasonable Republicans, those Lincoln Republicans are not willing to give him a second chance because he did so bad the first go round. Yes. Um, not to, to beat a, a dead horse, but, you know, your your vote counts. So if you were a, a Bernie supporter or um, an Elizabeth Warren supporter, you know, make sure you're registered. Yeah. I mean, it's too late now, but make sure you're registered, make sure you're educated, and then don't go in there and vote for somebody for a joke. Right. Don't oh. write somebody in. That is a joke. <clears throat> Kanye West. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. My bad. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, here's, here, here's what I also want to say. It is too late to vote in this election, but if you realize that you're not registered to vote right now, go get registered to vote tomorrow. Okay, don't wait until the next election comes up and then be too late again. Don't get registered to vote today. Uh, get your life together. <laughs> Understand how important it is that you vote. But like make a plan now uh, for, you know, 2021. Make a plan now for 2022. Like make a plan now for 2024. Like quit waiting until the last minute to, to try to figure out whether or not you can support the person that you care about and ask your friends if they're registered to vote, normalize asking your friends if they're registered to vote. You don't have to have arguments with them unless you want to. And I definitely want to with my friends <laughs> about who they're going to vote for, but make sure that they're registered to vote and tell them the, 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 the greatest indoctrination and the best form of voter suppression is telling people that their vote doesn't count or that their vote doesn't matter. That is the greatest form of voter suppression because I don't have to make you wait in a long line or have to make you travel a long distance to vote if I can keep you at home in the first place. Right. It's so, easy. So you were taught by somebody that your vote doesn't count. They were wrong. It does count. And that's why they don't want you to use it. Josh is spilling the tea all over the place this and episode. Even if, even if you think it doesn't count, what is it going to hurt to vote? Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, don't be a coward. Cast your vote. Right. And, right. and, and not to oh, go ahead, Josh. I'm sorry. I'm still going. I, I, you know, it's all good. you look at uh, Senator Allison Eichley Freeman in Tulsa, uh, won her election by like 26 votes, mm -hmm. became the youngest uh, 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 person elected in the Senate uh, for a, in a long time. She was the first openly LGBTQIA plus person to represent us in the Senate. Uh, now, whether or not she's done a good job is a whole completely different conversation, but we got her in there because of just 26 votes. Uh, Kendra Horn, I think like 2,600 votes, was the first Democratic congressional member elected in over 50 years. Like the, there's so many races in the second district that were decided by one vote or two votes. Like every single uh, time there's an election across this country, a handful of votes matter. If you want to be like the mayor of Tahlequah and you can convince 3,000 people to vote for you, you'll be the mayor of Tahlequah. Like, it's that simple. You, you probably have that many friends on Facebook. Mm. So it's, it's super important that you get involved and that you, that you vote. Every vote definitely matters. And I can probably give you a, a list of 20 different races where that's the case. Yeah, absolutely. And, and not to um, cut too much into the um, into the next question, but I mean, like we could even argue that like, yes, like our vote for president in Oklahoma more than likely isn't going to matter. But you know what does your local elections like and those are the ones that will that, that's what will impact you even more. So I don't, I don't want to take away uh, your thunder lake for the next question, uh, but I just wanted to throw in that little tidbit really quick. Yeah, um, I think. Rose Gold has a has a great uh, podcast called Protect Rose Gold at, Gold at All Costs, where they talk about local elections because the boys of Rose Gold get involved with their local elections. If you are tired of not getting a quick turnaround with your presidential vote, get involved in your local elections. You'll get those results much quicker and 
you get to see the community that you live in every day change because of something you did. Uh, with that, I'll go to the next question. <laughs> um, do you think that Democrats will flip the House and the Senate and how important are our local elections, speaking of them? Flip the House in Oklahoma? Oh, excuse me. Uh, congressionally. Uh, flip the House and Senate nationwide, like get the trifecta. Oh, well, we already have the House, so we don't want to flip that. Okay. <laughs> be Republican. Right. <laughs> um, flipping the Senate, I think, is definitely something that's a possibility. Um, there are so many Republicans who attach themselves too heavily to Trump. And um, it's going to be their downfall. There's also a lot of Republicans who realized that Trump was going down and said, hey, maybe I should back off of this a little bit because because I don't want to uh, end up, you know, hurting myself. But Lindsey Graham, oh, the God. fact that, yeah. you know, Jamie Harrison is breaking records in fundraising and competing in a seat where he was that powerful and has that much influence. Like, that's a difference maker. Um Mitch McConnell's opponent uh, probably won't be successful, but the fact that, you know, she was able to raise like $80 million uh, to challenge him uh, is definitely something that puts him on notice that, like, his seat isn't as safe as he thought it was. Um, and Mississippi, uh, Espy, is kind of, you know, a game changer. That's not something that we didn't think we would have. I think Doug Jones is the only senator in the South right now uh, Mike Espy possibly joining that is, is a difference maker. Um, Abby Broyles here in Oklahoma in Q4 out, out fundraising in Hoff. I, I don't, unfortunately, I don't think that that's necessarily going to equate to success, but her race is going to uh, drastically impact down ballot races and help those folks actually uh, get elected. So it matters who's at the top of the ticket and how well they're doing and how serious of a candidate they are and how much money they can raise and how effectively they can do outreach because that helps down ballot. And, and if we can get enough folks in, uh, you know, in the house to kind of stop this super majority that they have, that's a difference maker. If we have to, if we make Republicans in the house in Oklahoma start actually negotiating with Democrats, we're gonna see better legislation. They haven't had to do it, and that's why things have been so bad. The teacher walkout, the best example of this every single day, that teacher walkout, the Democrats voted uh, on several different or made several different motions for legislation. And every single time, you know, it was party lines, basically, except for the uh, COLA bill, uh, where Republicans were saying no. Like, that's the kind of stuff that we want to actually have a little input and say so in so that we can start. Uh, seeing pro progress in our in our state and in our country, so top of the ballot is extremely important. We we definitely need to get Trump out of office, but down ballot is where we're going to see progressive policies actually enacted. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and then oh man, oh man, this is our next to last question. Dang, we uh, this has been a really good conversation Zoomed through there. Uh, I mean, no, we're actually clocked in at uh, one hour and eight minutes. So we're, this is uh, this has been an awesome conversation, everybody. Um, so this is kind of a theory that's been kind of circling around um, people that I talk to. Um, so this is mainly why I wanted to know it. So should Biden win? How likely is it that he only serves one term, meaning that um, not because he would like get impeached or die or anything, but because he would just simply want to pass the torch on to um, to to hopefully Vice President Harris? Uh, do you think that's totally outside of the realm of possibility or do you think he has a game plan for that yeah no i honestly think that he uh, he only does one term um joe biden ran because he knew we needed to beat trump and he knew that unfortunately he was the best chance that we had um i think he he's gonna uh give a lot of um uh, responsibility to senator harris uh, to let her kind of get the, the, the ropes and understand how things are going. And then he's going to peacefully exit. Uh, he doesn't want to be president uh, for, for two terms. I don't, I don't believe that he does. I think that he wants to get in there. He wants to do a good job. He wants to create all the changes that he needs to. But Joe Biden isn't the kind of person who feels like he has to hold a seat forever. 
um, or that he's the only person who can do something. Uh, this was just unfortunately a time where we needed Joe Biden to run for president so that we could beat Donald Trump. And we couldn't leave it to chance with anybody else. And I think a lot of people believe that. Mm. Awesome. Thank you, Josh. No problem. Do I have the final question? You sure do. That's why I oh gave you the God. odds. Want, uh, yeah, since, you, since you're joining the I lake. I thought you and just I wanted... wanted to be evens for even Stevens. No, no. Since you're co-hosting, I, uh, since you're co-hosting, I wanted to uh, have you star and end it. So you're a rock star. <laughs> Wow. Um, okay. Final question, at least, at least for this bit. Yeah. Um, how is the Demic party working differently than in past elections to connect with millennials and Gen Zers? You know, um, this year, w w two, so oh, there's so many thoughts about this, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> Untangle the ran, web. <laughs> right. When I ran for president of YDA, I was pissed because I was like, why is this not the main source that campaigns are going to to get talent, resources, education on policy? Like these are the people who are doing the work in so many of the states, right? Uh, of course, there are people doing it outside of uh, Young Dems, but, you know, a lot of people in Young Dems are doing the work in their states. Why don't we have this great relationship with them? Uh, Hillary Clinton in 2016 wanted our superdelegate votes. And so they courted us for the superdelegate votes. And then once they got them, didn't care uh, about us too much after that, right? And that was kind of uh, disheartening. And this year, not only has you know Joe Biden's uh, campaign been doing outreach to us, but a lot of the campaigns before you know folks dropped out were doing outreach to us. They were big supporters of us. They were they were showing up. Uh, I have a weekly call with the uh, Biden campaign. There's actually a briefing that's going on right now that started at eight o'clock that I should probably be on. But you know, I'm here with you guys. Um, but I talk to the Biden campaign every week. They tell me what they got going and, and ask us what we have going. They send out emails uh, to us to make sure that we're in the know with everything that the campaign is doing. They give us invites and ask us to speak at uh, different events that they're hosting and holding. Um, they, they have asked our opinion on platform pieces to say, hey, is this something that you guys agree with? Uh, that's been phenomenal. They think that this, uh, this campaign season has been very intentional on, on youth outreach and actually caring about the things that are important to us. I always say that one of the biggest mistakes that campaigns make is they talk about young issues with older people at young people, not to young people about the issues that are important to them. They think that they know and so they just kind of, uh, you know, create their own platform without it actually discussing it. Um, you guys may or may not know this. I worked for Mike Bloomberg for one month. Uh, he paid me an obscene amount of money. Uh, <laughs> and, and so I took the job, even though he wasn't anywhere near my top choice. But I left that job because he didn't, he said, you, young people aren't our target demographic, so we're not going to focus our time, effort, and energy on that. I was like, you have unlimited resources, but you don't care about young people. That makes no sense to me. Right. And so, you know, I think that, you know, with the Biden campaign, with a lot of the other campaigns, they knew that young people were going to be a difference maker. The only bigger difference maker than young people were going to be the black vote, uh, which is why Joe Biden... Uh, if you remember this, after he lost New Hampshire and everybody went to Nevada, he actually went to South Carolina. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and he made a speech that I'll never forget. He said, uh, let me give you a number, 99.9. .9. That's how many uh, Black people in this country haven't had their voice heard. Let me give you another number, 99.8. That's how many Hispanic people haven't had their voice heard in this election. It's not over. He banked on the Black vote then. And that's why he won South Carolina the way he did. That's why he went into Super Tuesday the way he did. And then he said immediately from there, it's about coalition building. Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring in Pete. I'm going to bring in Andrew Yang. I'm going to bring in Amy Klobuchar. I'm going to bring in Beto O'Rourke. And I'm going to say, hey, help me win over everyone, uh, especially young people. And I mean, the Hamilton cast, 
uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just my dream, honestly. <laughs> uh, the Hamilton cast, getting Lizzo, uh, getting all these other celebrities. Uh, Billie Eilish actually spoke at the DNC to, to the, the Youth Caucus. Like, he has spared uh, no, no effort in, in doing outreach to folks that he help, thinks is going to help him win over different communities, especially the young community. And for that, I'm just honestly grateful. I think that, you know, this is, this is a difference maker and I think you're seeing it with the numbers. Absolutely. Um, well, Josh, thank you so, so, so much for uh, joining us today. Um, we do have another section of the podcast um, called Stevia Sound Off, which is where um, it's basically fan questions. But if you have to go to your other obligations, especially with it being election week, uh, we totally get it. Um, so, again, just thank you so much for this wonderful conversation today. I mean, you know, what's Stevia Sound Off? I want to be involved. Okay, we can be involved. Okay, so, okay. <laughs> Um, this part we should blaze through. Okay, this part shouldn't uh, shouldn't take as long. Um, so Stevia Sound Off is a section where Team Stevia sends us questions and takes, good or bad, we don't care. And as long as they're within reason, everyone on the show will answer them. And we post a weekly thread on our Instagram story and our Twitter. And we have a dedicated channel on our Discord for this section. Um, so I guess we can go ahead and start out. So um, uh, JTAG, uh, he writes, um, everyone has a gap in knowledge that is super basic but somehow you managed to miss learning it properly so in the show um, how i met your mother barney can't use a screwdriver ted can't say chameleon correctly uh robin uh, thought the north pole was made up and so on and so forth uh so he wants to know what is your basic gap in knowledge and for me i can't blow a bubble with bubble gum that's something that i've never been able to do no way really yep, can't do it 100 percent can't do it yep huh. <laughs> For me, I can't go a restaurant to save my life. Wow. Like every single time I try to spill, <laughs> like I mess it up. And then like, luckily, like technology allows me to be able to fix that. But every single time I try to spill, and I just learned how to spell Wednesday, like a couple <laughs> years ago, my girlfriend at the time was like, Wednesday. Oh yeah, Wednesday. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that helped me. But I, I have not figured out how to spell a restaurant to this day. Cool. I'm I'm really trying to think of of something that fits that very niche description, um, and I honestly I always I'm so sorry I have dogs everywhere, um, I don't know uh, anything that is like oh my god hold on let me let this dog out uh, anything that is related to like colonial America. Um, probably like after the declaration i i i'm in literature and so i studied journals but i have no idea about like uh, fashion outside of petticoats i i guess would be my okay example. that's <laughs> Very fair niche i'm so sorry <laughs> no I that's fair that, that i mean that works pressure. yeah <laughs> all right what's the next one we have lakin uh so mike cambiano do I have to read this? Uh, <laughs> it would make it would make Cody really happy. Okay, uh, Mike Cambiano. <laughs> oh, did you? I, like, I think you cut out. Okay, childish Gambino wants oh, there we to go. know. Okay, there we Coke go. Or Pepsi. Okay, what do you got, Lakin? Oh, did it cut out? Sorry. Oh, we we, uh, we says, got you. Uh, Mike Cambiano, do I need to read that again? No, you're or good. Or do you just want me to answer? No, um, nope, it came back in. So, so, so you're good for the answer. Answer. For the oh, culture, I, I gotta say. Oh, 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 you did? Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, sorry, like, it. sorry, like, and go ahead. <laughs> okay, I just want to let Josh know my, my roommate Maddox is here, and he said that he loves you. That's all. I love Maddox. He says he loves you back. Okay. okay. As long as he knows. <laughs> as long as he knows. <laughs> I miss you so much. I can't wait to, to see your face and hug you. He says he misses you and he can't wait to see your face and hug you. Oh, no. He said we got to get to the pandemic first. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> okay. This is, this is fair. Question. Mike Cambiano, a.k.a. Childish Gambino, wants to know <laughs> Coke versus Pepsi. And for the culture, I got to go with Pepsi. A Bepsis, yes. <laughs> Um, 
I think I would say Pepsi for sure, unless it's Cherry Coke. If it's Cherry Coke, that like that reigns supreme over all else. The flavor is what does it for you. Oh, God, I love Cherry Coke. Yeah, that's like <laughs> that, that is perhaps other than my use of y'all and fixin to uh, that is probably the most southern thing about me is my love for Cherry Coke. It's oh, delicious. I you were going to say the whitest thing about you. I was oh. going to say that's a different brand of white than my half. No, no, so. no, 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 no. We're good. No, I was saying Southern. Got to do that for this for, for the culture, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the. Uh, <laughs> you know, my mom didn't like my mom's favorite drink was Pepsi, and she wouldn't allow me to drink it as a kid because it was like off limits. We could drink all the other stuff, but not her Pepsi. Mm. So. It's like this thing to this day where I don't drink Pepsi, not because it's not delicious, like I love the flavor, but I don't drink <laughs> Pepsi because it was always off limits. So I have to go Coke. Do you have that like installed fear that if you drink Pepsi, somehow she's <laughs> going to know and come hit you with her shoe or something? For sure. Yeah, that's how mine is with putting clothes on the floor with my grandma. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's that's hilarious. Putting clothes I was like on the she's floor. not here, but she's going to know. She's yeah, gonna call me. It, she's going to know. It's, you know, it, it, that would be like if I touch the thermostat at my house, my dad's like he'll just like it'll ping. He'll be like, oh, Stephen touched the thermostat, you know, I love a spidey sense. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so I want to know what is your favorite emoji and why? And Josh, we'll start with you. Uh, my favorite emoji or the one that I use the most. Ooh, that's a good question. Let's go with that favorite. Is a good question. Favorite. Favorite has to be probably like the Black Power Fist because I use it all the time. Okay. Uh, but I don't use it the most because it's like the purple heart is the one that I use the most because purple was my mom's favorite color. Mm -hmm. And so anytime anything sweet happens or like I'm supposed to be like kind or, or <laughs> thankful, it's always the purple heart. Aw, okay. Oh, that's so wholesome. I was about to say that. This is so wholesome. All right, like, <laughs> like, what you got? Um, okay, I guess I'll answer the same way. I think my favorite emoji. Um, okay, let me. I'll take it back. My <laughs> my most commonly used emoji, and this is not reflective of myself, is like the. I call it the simp emoji, but I don't know what it's actually called. The one where they've got like the big eyeballs and they're like, Oh, the Please. pleading, the, the pleading face. Yeah, yeah. 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 I use that one a lot. Um, and then I guess my favorite is probably the bat emoji, but that's because they're so cute. They are very cute. Um, okay. So for me, the, my favorite emoji, which is weird because I'm not an aggressive person in the slightest. Anybody who's ever met me knows I'm a total wimp and a pushover. If you say a uh, knife, I'm going to cry. No, it's not going to be a knife. No. So my favorite, my, uh, my favorite emoji is the one where, uh, he's like, look, uh, the emoji person is looking up and he's blowing steam out his nose. Uh, mm -hmm. the, like the victorious one. Uh, for some reason, I love that emoji. It, ma it makes me look more powerful than I really am. Um, uh, <laughs> but I would say my most used emoji is definitely the cowboy one which is also weird because i'm just a i'm a suburb kid you know like i've you know can't yeah you know, like i like i can't do anything with ffa or anything like that but i use the cowboy emoji a lot partner so that's got that's got to be it for me <laughs> yeah partner yep yeah, partner yeah <laughs> love it awesome oh, is this gonna is this my question yeah man you got the last one for this one too lakin yes. awesome boom you're killing it Wow, I'm actually just replacing Lydia. Um, what? I'm I'm kidding, Lydia. Don't kill me. <laughs> uh, Stephen also wants to know, what were you going to be for Halloween? Um, I was going to be drunk for Halloween, <laughs> and, and I ended up not drinking, which sucks. So, but if I were to use uh, an, an outfit or if I were to dress up, which was definitely not going to happen, uh, then I would have been, what's the kid from Hey Arnold who has like the hair? Oh, Gerald. Gerald. Yeah. Because I have I have the haircut for it this awesome. time around. So I would have got a red shirt and put a three on it and been like, boom. Easy enough. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right, Lakin, um, uh, um, Lakin what, um, what were you going to be for Halloween? Um, 
Oh God. I think that I kind of knew in March that I wasn't going to dress up for Halloween. Cause if I'm going to dress up for Halloween, I'm going out right? and I'm showing out. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, um, I think I put it in the discord somewhere, what I was going to be or what I, I think I would have gone for, but I don't remember now. Oh. I can think of like at uh, least. Th- um, I can look if you'd like. Yeah. Um. It looks like. Oh. Oh. Yeah. 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 Okay. Do you want me to say it for you? Where Where did you find it? It's, it's so fast. It's literally in the Stevia sound off. It's the most recent one. Oh, I wasn't supposed to. Oh. Oh. Um, yeah, you're there. Yeah, I got it. Uh, I watched. I finally watched The Witcher this year. So after, good. After, um, everyone telling me how great it was, it makes me very uncomfortable because it kind of sets expe- expectations really high. Finally watched it. Well deserved reviews. And I wanted to try to do my take on like a feminine witcher just because they're so badass. And you would have killed that too. Like just, just, just knowing you, you would have nailed that, um, nailed that costume. And and that's why I said, and that's why I said were going to be for Halloween because like it was, (laughs) it it was funny because like back in March, you'd be like, oh, this will be over by Halloween. (laughs) No, it wasn't. So, um, So I guess finally, um, what Abby, uh, my wife and I, we were going to be, I was going to be inspector gadget and then she was going to be Dr. Claw. Um, and then, uh, so she would have had like one of those like dollar store, like grabbers, you know, if, like the little <laughs> claw things that she would have like had up her sleeve like that. Um, and then, um, one of our dogs would have been the cat that Dr. Claw has, even though we, we don't, we don't have a cat, we have dogs. So awesome. So, uh, yeah, Josh, thank you for having fun with us there. And that actually does it team. So, um, we hope you all enjoyed the, uh, the conversation, uh, with Lakin and Josh and above all else, we hope you go out and vote on Tuesday. Uh, so really quick, you can follow us on all the social media platforms with the handle at the Stevia show. And if you're on YouTube, just simply search for the Stevia show and just go ahead and, um, smash that subscribe button and, uh, go ahead and click the notification bell as well. Uh, we stream twice a week. So be sure to check that out. And finally, we would like to thank our anchor and our Patreon producers for their continued support. You can support us for as little as 99 cents a month and receive exclusive discord roles and bonus episodes every month. Uh, But here we are, team, uh, almost one hour and 30 minutes later. Uh, Thank you all for hanging out with us. And thank you, Josh and Lakin, for being awesome, awesome guests and co-hosts on the show today. But for now, this is Steven. Oh, man. Oh, is that me? Yeah, I was pointing at Josh. I'm supposed to say this is Josh, but this is, this is Steven. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm actually, if this, you would have had to point the other way. Oh, okay. Hey. For, 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 me, for me, it's that way. Okay, gotcha. So, okay. Okay, take two. This is Steven. <laughs> this is Josh. And this is Lakin. And we will see you all later. Bye. Take it easy, guys. Bye.